Well, I, I like to think that God has a sense of humor that he would ask me to speak on patience. I, uh, that really is, is interesting, especially if you knew my story over this past year and uh, near the end, uh, last, beginning of last fall into the summer, last year my daughter and her husband moved back from Scotland and he had finished his education as a physical therapist. And what had happened was, was he, they moved into our house for a brief season <clears throat> so, so that uh, he could pass the boards and she would have twins. We knew she was having twins, a boy and a girl, Ewan and Saoirse. And uh, that then he would get a job and uh, they would move out. Well, she had the twins, which was a miraculous situation because she went in for a routine uh, checkup. And while she was in the hospital, her placenta ruptured. There was blood all over the operating floor. If she was at home, she would have died. And because she happened to be in the hospital, not just happened, it was God, that they were able to do an emergency C-section and save her life. And I arrived at the hospital hearing this news in Davis. So my wife and I hop in the car. We go to Davis. We walk in, and 10 minutes later... They hand my wife and I these two babies. I mean, we skipped all the drama. <laughs> but never fail, there was more to come. So then after she gave birth and we have the new babies in the home and everything, and now Bobby is applying for jobs, which thank you, Jesus, he landed the big fish. He's a physical therapist with Kaiser. So he, he just got a phenomenal job. And uh, so he's stationed out of Vacaville. And uh, anyway, but shortly after her pregnancy, my daughter, many of you know, was having some vision problems. And so we found out that she had a tumor, a meningioma, at the base of her skull, in the wall between her skull and her brain. And so uh, everybody was praying and and I have to give a testimony to community. My daughter and son-in-law lived in Boston for eight years. And um, their community there from Boston flooded them in this season with gift cards. And uh, just all, all, I mean, there was, it seemed like not a week that went by that there wasn't one or two or even three hundred dollar gift cards for groceries and things like that. That whole community, which just is a testimony to how community is supposed to work. Can I get an amen? amen. So anyway, we, that's old school, isn't it? Can I get an amen? <laughs> uh, so anyway. So then what happened was we're praying. My daughter has the operation. All of us are praying here. Uh, it's a success. She's in recovery, though. They can't really move out. She can't take care of baby twins when she's recovering from brain surgery, right? So we keep them in the home even longer. And so when it's all said and done, over the, and, and I have to say this. My son-in-law exercised some wisdom beyond his years when throughout the whole course of this season that they were in our home, uh, we only got in two heated discussions and then we quickly realized we needed to stay away from politics. <laughs> so so we, we shut the political discussion down and just loved on each other, which could be a good example for the church. And anyway, so we began, and, and, and one day Bobby said, he entered into a discussion and, and exercised some wisdom and said, hey, let's just all talk about what's happening here. And this is an exercise in intentional patience. He said, I know we've been here longer than we planned on being here, right? And, and yeah, but, and we all knew we're fine. We all love each other. It's okay, but we know there's going to be an opportunity for tensions and, and uh, to flare up, especially with screaming babies and a Siberian husky that leaves hair everywhere he goes. 
And, and so we ended up just having that discussion together. Hey, and basically the gist was, let's acknowledge what's going on here and make it a point to exercise intentional patience with each other, right? That's a good word. And I was proud of my son-in-law for engaging that conversation with us. So then finally, as time went on, and, and also my daughter grew up in this church, led worship here. And so all of her community from the youth group way back in the day, there wasn't a week that went by that two or three of them didn't come through our house and help watch the kids. That's community. That's what community is. So even over the years, they're still there fellowshipping, supporting one another. So then uh, we get down to it, and I have to say that there were two things that made this stint completely unbearable. Now, I'm out of the woods now. They moved out yesterday. (laughs) And I say, thank you, Jesus, with some reservation both ways, because I got up this morning, and I was on baby duty every morning for eight and a half months. What that means is my wife and my daughter got up in the middle of the night to take care of the babies, but I'm an early riser. I said I'll take the morning shift, so every morning I was up with Ewan and Saoirse changing diapers, making bottles for probably an hour to two hours every morning. So I... I I didn't... (laughs) I didn't say that for applause, but (laughs) it's just... But I got up this morning, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking, and I'm like, man, there's a love-hate here. <laughs> you know what I mean, Sarah? It's kind of, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like, wow, you know? And thank God there was no more dog hair on the carpet. I mean, I like that part of it. But I'm sitting here, I don't know if I like this, you know, all the... But there were two things that made this last year so difficult for me that no words could describe how difficult it was. So I made a video to share with you what that is. Ooh, ooh, I'm spaghetti, all covered with cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my poor meatball when somebody sneezed. <laughs> it rolled off the table. And onto the floor. <laughs> and then my poor meatball, it rolled out the door. <laughs> so anyway, it, it, they really are a blessing. And thank God they live close by. You know, at one point in our lives, we had my daughter and son-in-law who live here locally now in Ethiopia. Bobby and Stephanie were in Boston. And my son is with his wife and my other grandson live in Nashville. So they were scattered to the three corners of the globe uh, at one point. So it's kind of nice to have a couple of them back here locally. Well, I want to talk to you today uh, about patience. And I'm going to do three things in this message I'm going to create, uh, we're, our conversation is going to develop a context for what was going on at that time to kind of help guide our thoughts into the process of what patience and the fruit of the Spirit is. Then the next thing I'm going to do is talk about patience specifically as a fruit of the Spirit and what are some of the deceptions that patience can accompany in patience in our lives. And then how can we create an environment to allow patience or any fruit of the Spirit to flourish in our lives. So those will be the three conversations. So in an effort to develop some context here, I want to talk a little bit about what Paul was facing at the time he wrote this passage. And in reality, there were, uh, well, ultimately, what the town of Galatia was was the Gauls had migrated to that area, hence the name of the town Galatia. And at this season in Bible history and in history, Galatia was a thriving 
economic metropolis of income and trade. And so many Jews had migrated to Galatia to capitalize on that economic commerce and establish their families there. So Paul felt the need, not only compelled by the Spirit, but knew that there were Jews living there and that there would be an opportunity to share the gospel with Gentiles as well. So Paul did his missionary journey to Galatia and spent some time there establishing a church. And when we say a church, we want to remember that we're talking about an extended family network. When we think of churches from a Western standpoint, we think of this context. But back then, many of the churches were only 20 to maybe 40 people. If you were really hopping and popping, you might have had 50 uh, but this was, this was what we're talking about when Paul establishes a church. He's talking about ex- establishing an extended family of people that become the nucleus for what God's going to do in that region. And so in that context, Paul establishes this church. And then uh, what happens is there's this group called Judaizers and What they were were Jewish Christians who hadn't really understood the freedom that we have in Christ, and they were still under the impression that you needed to obey Mosaic law or Old Testament law if you were going to be a Christian. So they came in. They would follow Paul around from place to place, and after he would establish a church and leave, then the Judaizers would come in and try to impose Mosaic law on the Christians there. And so this whole book of Galatians is about Paul. He's left, and just imagine the frustration. Who knows? I I don't know how much time Paul spent in Galatia, but imagine the frustration. He's established a church. People are loving Jesus. They've gotten their feet on the ground. They've been discipled in the fundamentals, and then Paul leaves, and then these Judaizers come in and just start muddying the water. That's just got to be frustrated. And he's already in another location doing another work. So what does he do? He writes a letter to the Galatians to try to help them piece through this deception of being drawn back into the law and the bondage that can be associated with that and not living in the freedom of the spirit. And so now this whole book of Galatians is don't go back to the law. Live in the spirit. And so we find as this whole conversation culminates, when Paul gets to the fruit of the spirit, he's doing more than listing a series of standards or principles that we should aspire to, to live like and become. He is describing and defining what a life in the freedom of the Holy Spirit looks like. So when we read this list, this is you. This is how you get to live. This is God's blessing on the church. Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is what we get to live. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness and self control. What a life. Just think about that. What a life. What a blessing. And then he says, against such things there is no law. Doesn't that put a whole different light on that statement? There's no law against those things. I don't think it's a mistake that love is the forerunner to this list. Everything flows out of the love of God. Sometimes it's helpful if you want to see what something is to look at what it's not. We have two defined lists in the New Testament 
of provisions by the Holy Spirit. One is here, the fruit of the Spirit. The other one is the gifts of the Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 12, I'm not, I'm not going to turn there for sake of time, but Paul lists out those gifts. Some of them are healing, prophecy, working of miracles, the gift of faith, tongues, interpretation of tongues, uh, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Well, I guess I did list them all. But <laughs> anyway, but Paul defines the operation of those gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 11, and he says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each, indivi each one individually, just as he wills. It's important for us to realize when we talk about the gifts of the spirit, that God distributes those as he wills in this current context in the church right now. But that's not what the fruit of the spirit is. In Romans 5.5, 5, it says, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been, past tense, poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. They're in there. The love of God is in there. All the fruit is in there. Amen. We get to live that. That's the blessing. That's God's legacy. That's the legacy of Christ to us. 2 Peter 1.3 says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. This is more than a set of life principles that we live. It's in us. It's in us right now as we live and breathe those things are in us. Whatever fruit of the Spirit you feel you are lacking, you are not lacking. It's in there. Right? Well, Pastor Mark, if it's in there, why do I struggle with impatience? Well, we, we always have that battle. It is the fruit of the Spirit versus the weeds of the flesh. Right? Right? And when we renew our mind and become spiritually minded, then it allows the fruit to emerge, that fruit that God has imparted to us by his Holy Spirit to emerge and come to full bloom in our lives as we renew our minds and live by the Spirit. Does that make sense? Now, this was God's best foot forward for us as Jesus left. And let's listen to what Jesus says about this. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. He's talking about Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. So get this. Jesus, the exact representation of God, is leaving this earth. He says, man, I'm going to do you one better than me. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. And what we find out is that that is exactly what we need in this season of our lives. I used to run a landscaping company, and when I would leave people on job sites to do things, I knew that there were two things I had to do for that job site. Number one, I had to leave all of the instructions necessary for them to do the job right. And number two, I had to leave all of the resources, all the tools, the materials, everything for them so that when I left, I knew that they could do the job. And that's practical, common sense logic that that's what it takes. But you know what? We get that from God and it's modeled here. God left us his instruction, his word. He left us all the details of what we needed to do. And our resource is the Holy Spirit. And all of those fruits that are in us, you know, it's interesting. When I'm ministering kingdom, I don't have to go look for a shovel. Patience is meant to just pour right out of me. 
love is, I, it's like in the physical, it would look like me manifesting a shovel with my arm. That's what it would look like. God has so thoroughly equipped us by putting it on the inside of us. Let's look at patience for a moment as a fruit. And it's important to note that the word for fruit in this passage uh, uh, carries other meanings to it other than just the fruit. It also carries the thought of benefit or proceeds and profit. So a good way to look at this scripture would be the benefit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Interesting, huh? The profit that kingdom living will show up, the form it will show up in your life is love, joy, peace, patience. See, so it's interesting to see that as we walk by the Spirit, we feel this sense of spiritual prosperity happening, and it comes in the manifestation of the fruit. Also, patience is the only fruit of the Spirit that is defined by the Word of God to function in tandem with faith. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. It says, so that you will not be sluggish. And patience does not mean being sluggish. It doesn't mean, well, God knows my address. I'm just going to kick back here and wait for him to show up. That's not what it means. So that you would not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. James chapter 1 verse 4. And let patience or endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Faith and patience work together because no matter what it is that we are believing God for, it's not going to happen like that. There's going to be some patience mixed in with that. Patience is sneaky. Impatience is sneaky with me. It'll show up and I'll be living in it and not even know it. And so I thought I would share some of those ways that it does that with me, with you. And hopefully some of you will identify with it and I won't be the only one in the room because that would be really awkward. (laughs) But first of all, I don't like lines. And I avoid lines all the time, especially the on-ramp from I-80 to 65. (laughs) I avoid that like crazy. And I live in Loomis, so a lot of times that's, that's my path. And I will go around and take another route, just so I can feel the feeling of forward momentum. (laughs) And I know, I know that there are times that I probably would have gotten there quicker if I just lived through the bottleneck and came out the other side and got to where I was going, which is interesting because our impatience makes us feel like we're stuck when really we're not. And where God has us is the path he wants us to take to get to where we need to go quicker. But our impatience says, no, I'm going to go this way. And it takes me longer to get to where I want to go. Right? There's something to be learned there. So, and I, 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 I don't like lines, and especially when I'm standing in a line that's long, and there's only one checkout person, and there's five other employees standing around doing nothing. <laughs> now, that, that is a situation that is hard to take for me. But the reality is, is that is the perfect opportunity for self-deception to sneak in and justify my impatience. Because I'm justified. What are all these employees doing standing around here? There's five checkout stands empty. Why doesn't one of them grab a checkout stand? And so in my 
view of logic, I'm sitting here going through this frustration when in reality, there is no justification for impatience. Can I say that again? There is no justification for impatience. And all that emotion throws up a smoke screen. Emotion is like a fog if it's rooted in the flesh and it blinds you to what's going on. There could be a divine appointment standing right next to me in that line. There could be something that God wants to do in that moment. But if I've got the whole situation focused on me, then it just gets ugly Ugly, ugly, ugly. Lack of attention to detail. My wife will tell you, I am the most undetailed person in the world. And as a matter of fact, I don't even like looking at a menu. You, when we go out to eat dinner, I'm dead serious. I, I am like, I will, I, you know, especially if you go somewhere like Cheesecake Factory where it's like a book, you know, you open that thing up, I open that menu up, I start breaking out in a rash. You know, I mean, I just do not like that much detail. And so I will, I will just say, uh, you know, hey, this is what I want to the waitress. Do you have anything like that? She goes, oh, yeah, we have this right here on the menu. Okay, great, I'll take that. Leave out this, this, and this. And that's how I order. Okay, and my wife gets frustrated with me. She's, Mark, why don't you read the menu? <laughs> you know? but, and, and she makes a good point. But I do know, I do know that there are seasons in my life where I can't afford to not be detailed. Now, I can be detailed, but it is my impatience that makes me feel like if I go into this detail, I am going to be sucked into this black hole of detailed minutia. And I just, oh God, you know. But the reality is if I exercise patience and I acknowledge what is going on here, there is some detail that needs to be paid attention to here and I need to carve out a portion of my life because I'm not stupid. I can look at details and figure out, and I have to consciously say, Lord, is this a season of my life where I need to be detailed? Yes, and I get detailed, and you know what? I do okay. Do I want to live there? No, <laughs> but, but I can be detailed. Frustration over a lack of progress. People in, who have had construction done on their homes can identify with this principle or had any kind of work done. And uh, uh, this morning, Nina was sharing during worship how we've been going through the motions and uh, we get disconnected from our intimacy with God is kind of how she put it. She didn't put it in those words exactly. But I got to thinking about that, how sometimes I can get impatient, through impatience, I can get frustrated over the lack of progress. And what that frustration does is it immerses my thought process and how am I going to unstick this? And it pulls me away from my intimacy with God. And I had a little repentance moment right there on the front row. I was like, Wow. And then finally, poor listening skills. Now, I know that there are people that you can ask them a question and they'll talk for 10 minutes and not answer the question. <laughs> I know that there are people that way. And I'm not going to look at anybody in particular. Just keep smiling and looking at me and nobody will know it's you. Okay, but I, 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 and I, I have a hard time taking that. I have the attention span of a gnat. <laughs> and people who know me know this is true. And so I thank God for people like my brother John DeShaw here, <laughs> who co-labors with me in community, because he has phenomenal people skills. And when he sees my brain wandering... He just reaches over and touches me on the arm. And guess what, Mark? And it pulls me right back in. It's like pushing a button on a robot. 
you know. And other people, and I give you all permission to do that. If you're talking to me in the lobby, yes, focus. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so I, I struggle in this area. And now, sure, I, I don't want to hear necessarily about somebody's Aunt June's peach cobbler in Georgia. You know, I might not want to hear a story about that at the time, although it sounds good. But uh, what I really, what I, when I'm in that conversation, I have to realize, you know, this isn't about me getting the answer to my question, right? It's about them sharing the treasure of their heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If I make it about me, it gets ugly. But if I make it about them, there's an opportunity to love somebody by listening to them. And so those are the things that impatience uh, can do in my life. I know, ultimately, and follow me on this, it's not in my notes, but I'm going to try to get this right. I know, ultimately, that my impatience is linked to my desire to be productive. Because God's wired all of us to be productive. And if we don't, we miss a certain aspect of health in our character. And that's why people get numb and lost if they're not being productive. So God's wired us. Why would God not wire us to be productive if he wants us to build his church? We're wired to be productive. But where that becomes unhealthy is ultimately that is linked to my desire to achieve the approval of men. Now, Mark, you're sounding like a sissy. Well, we're all sissies, okay? It's just that I know it. So wired for the approval of men. Why? Why? Because in my fallen state, I'm insecure. And in my insecurity, I want to achieve the approval of men. And why am I insecure? Because everything in this world is decaying. Everything is falling apart. All of creation groans and travails. And my insecurity is linked to a concept called self-preservation. And ultimately, I don't need to self-preserve. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonians, May you be preserved blameless, spirit, soul, and body by God. God's preserving me. Am I going to add anything to that? No, I'm not. So here in this moment, we don't have to engage the struggle of the counter life in the flesh to the fruit of the spirit. We can live freely in the fruit of the Spirit and let God take care of everything else. And Pastor Francis put it so well last week. When I'm not living in peace, it's because I'm not trusting God. So ultimately, it all boils down to that. In February of 06, I was a campus pastor at the time here at The Rock. And uh, I went to Kansas City uh, IHOP in Kansas City, and man, I'm going to have to get through this. Wow. Went to IHOP in Kansas City, and I was there fasting for a period of, of uh, uh, eight days and just really seeking the Lord. And I had three questions. Two of them had been answered throughout the course of the week, but there was one holdout. And so I was really wanting to get that final answer so I could start eating again. You know, I was, I was, but I I was not. Sometimes you just got to be desperate enough to, I'm not going to eat anything until I get this answer. You know, we just got to be desperate for God sometimes. And so I am, I was waiting and the final day I was there and it was all linked to this whole, I was seeking the Lord about why can't I just be still? Why can't I just rest in the Holy Spirit and enjoy my Father? What is it about my life that I'm struggling with? And that whole series of thought I just shared with you, I didn't know that. My self-awareness wasn't 
uh, even there yet to even define that for you at that time. So I'm sitting there praying. It's the last day, and this little girl couldn't have been over five feet tall, one of the prayer people in the prayer room. She couldn't have been over five feet tall, skin and bones, probably 70 pounds dripping wet, you know, walked up to me, and she grabbed my shirt by the collar and pulled me down to her level and said, the Lord wants you to know that rest is productivity. (laughs) Bam! (laughs) We need to know that we can rest in the Lord and that he's just going to bring the fruit out of our lives. Andy Stanley said this recently. I heard him say, um, the hardest person to have a conversation with about self-awareness is with someone who doesn't have it. That's hard. I've tried it. It doesn't work. So here's some help. Our series is called Engaging the Battle Within. So I want to give you a couple of pointers on this. Without specifics, you cannot experience any truth in God's word to its fullness. We can all sit here and agree on the concept of patience as a principle in God's word. But until we find a specific area of our lives and go to battle, the battle within, and expose our own frailties in that area, we're not going to achieve the self-awareness, being aware of what's going on within ourselves so we can pinpoint that weakness and take the sword of the Spirit and drive it right through its heart and dispel the lie with the truth. You're not going to do it. So I want you to ask you and challenge you to think specifically in the area of patience. Go deep within yourself. Pinpoint an area of impatience in your life that you're struggling with. Notice the triggers and bring people in your community together and have conversations with them about this. Be transparent with them and open with them. Wrestle with this with them. Get feedback from them. Process through this because that is really important in your maturation process and realize that all of that flows out of self-preservation, and I'm looking for that arena of thought that is directly linked to my self-preservation because that is a waste of time, and it's a lie. You cannot self-preserve. You can't. That's a lie. It's a waste of time. Okay, so now I got to really move fast through this last section. And then we'll take communion at the end. So I'm going to give you three rhythms in life that you can initiate in your life to produce an environment for the fruits, not only patient, but any fruit to emerge. And and the fruit of the Spirit needs a spiritual environment in order to thrive, just like a natural plant might need the right environment for it to grow healthy and produce fruit. The fruit of the Spirit needs a a a spiritual environment. Not only that, we establish environment in our lives by rhythms. Have you ever noticed if you do something once, it's not a rhythm. It's not part of your life. But when you do something on a regular basis over and over again, it becomes a rhythm in your life and it's part of the environment that you've created for yourself to grow. And so here's some rhythms for us. Number one, and I won't spend a lot of time on this one, it's the most obvious, it's one that we talk about, the rhythm of worshiping God and being in his word. The Bible says, as we behold him, we are transformed into his likeness. As I behold him, all the fruit of the spirit are a list of the attributes of God. I'm transformed in his likeness. The fruit of the spirit begins to emerge out of my life because that's who God is, and I'm being transformed into that. In 2 Peter uh, 
chapter 1, verse 3, again, the scripture will go back to it, seeing that his divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through what? Through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. So by receiving the truth of God's word, we receive more of his divine nature and we are transformed into who he is. Does that make sense? So that's worship in the word, number one rhythm. Number two rhythm is fellowship. And I have to say that our community group that meets on Wednesdays and, uh, and then the Guys Garage Club that meets on Saturday, all, all these people contributed to this message. I, we had a, a think tank going on for our garage club, so I want to thank those guys. But we see several times in scripture where this statement is made. Think about this. By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Think about what that implies and how it applies to fellowship. And is, is this on, Raish? Uh, and think how that applies to fellowship in our lives. If I'm not in fellowship with other people in the body, how am I going to be able to uh, converse and, and share with others about what God is showing me and allow that word to be established in my life if I'm a lone ranger, if I'm not in community? And being alone is the prerequisite to deception. If you're, if you're all alone, you're, you're a prime target for the devil. Because all you're left with is your own thoughts. And I'm telling you, that's not enough. That is not enough. I heard a podcast recently by Tim Keller. And I want to share this with you right now. Oh, sorry. Everything, nobody, no matter how great a speaker you are, or no matter how smart you are, no matter how powerful you are, whether you're the president of the United States, or, you know, is that how you're going to change the ghetto? If you're a great preacher and you really are articulate, is that how you're going to change people's lives spiritually? I tell you, listen, if you come here and you don't have a friend with you, you might get inspired by my preaching. Your life isn't going to be changed. If you don't have a friend to think about this with and work it in with, you're never, you're never going to learn. And when I, over the history of my, my education, the times in which I've learned the most, the places, the courses, the professors in which I said, that really changed my life, I look back and I realize it wasn't the professors, it was the people I was learning with, the friends, the people I ate in the cafeteria with afterwards, the people that worked it in. We can only have a few friends in our whole life. So the, the obvious importance of this statement is that, and I'm going to ask you all, wrestle with this. Don't, don't listen to what I'm saying and not have this conversation. I am issuing a challenge to you. Everyone in this room needs community. They need the fellowship of the faith. And I'm asking you to do more than listen to this and just think about it and then dismiss it. I'm asking you to wrestle with this by talking about it with your spouse, your family, and so on. And the third rhythm, and we can go ahead and start having the communion elements distributed here. The third rhythm is mission. This is such a part of our lives and our health in, from kingdom terms. And... Uh, I think about Paul and how he was frustrated. And I'm going to ask you to try to hang with me. Don't let the distribution of the elements uh, detract you from what I'm going to say here because this is important. It's important that we have mission in our lives because when we are focused on kingdom purpose, then our ability to exercise patience and the fruit of the Spirit takes on a whole different cause rather than just being displayed for our own self-interest. It takes on a bigger purpose. And in that, the fruit of the Spirit takes on a greater presence. Think about the patience that Paul had to exercise after establishing one church after another and the Judaizers coming in and taking it over. And I think of a brother in China that I know of named Brother Wei, 
who David Joannis, one of the missionaries we support, pioneered a church there. And after years of Brother Way lived on the top of this mountain and there was this village down below, would pray for his city. And after years, finally revival broke out. And I saw pictures online of people being baptized in a creek and the church grew exponentially overnight. And finally, the Holy Spirit broke through. There was revival in that village and they established this new church. And then soon after that, a bunch of witch doctors and satanic priests came in and found out what was going on. And they came down hard on the church and there was this big falling away after years of Brother Way praying over his village, seeing God move. Then the church was dispersed except for a handful of women. And once a week, Brother Way hops on his motorcycle in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., rides it down to that village, and as he gets close, he shuts off the engine and coasts in with the headlight off in the dark. And he pulls into a meeting point, and all those women wait until their husbands are asleep. And they sneak out under the cover of darkness. And they're discipled by Brother Way. That's patience. If you want to see patience emerge in a major way in your life, have kingdom purpose. Be missional in your living. That will take it to another whole level. And here is the gospel in this as we prepare to receive communion. Here's the gospel. Jesus ultimately exercised the ultimate patience with us. He is and was and always will be patient with us. And what's interesting is God didn't give us just love. He give a, gave us his love. And it's his patience he displayed on the cross that we get to live in now. That is the gospel in this message. Thank you, brother. So, Father, we thank you that your body was broken for us and that by being broken for us, Lord, you paved the way for the fruit of the Spirit and your life nature to pour through us, Father. Let's partake of the body. Father, we thank you for your blood that was shed to forgive us of our sin, God. And that even now, to this day, you are our advocate, Lord. We bless you and thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives that was made available by the shedding of your blood. In Jesus' name, let's receive that. If you need prayer for anything, or if God has, you've got to take away from this message and you need to vocalize it with somebody and have them pray for you, then I want to encourage you to come forward right now at this time and everyone else is dismissed. God bless you.